A lot of you have already submitted questions already, so we can jump right in. So again, if you've got a phone or a computer here in the sanctuary or at home, um, then you can go to slido.com, type in 5678, and you'll be able to see these questions. And you can scroll down. I think that's the um, earliest question all the way down to the most recent one. And if technology is not your thing, we're going to do this again next week. So jot a question down on a piece of paper if you want and give it to us, and we'll try to address that next week. So no worries if the technology is befuddling. So, All right. Okay. I, I set a 15-minute timer, and then we, that can be our like five-minute warning maybe. Okay, sounds good. After that. Um, I'm going to start off with an easy one. Where do we get our donuts from Anonymous Donut Lover? Um, great question. We have a standing order with Pixie Donuts right by the Vons in the parking lot there off of Baseline. And they are so great. They always have our donuts ready and they like to comment on what time we pick them up. Like, oh, running a little late today, are we? I'm like, thank you. Um, but they're great. All right. So, Jen, I think there's a common theme on some of these questions yeah. that we should just tackle right away. Yep. You know, I think that we're still sitting in tension and anger. The prayer of confession spoke to that. So someone said, how do I resolve the deep anger I have at the hate and my knowledge that I know that people are voting for hate? Or what um, someone says, how do we survive the next four years? How do you work through forgiveness with family members? Um, I think another common one is, what is a good way? Let's see. How do we get through Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah. Having a hard time with my family and friends right now. Yeah. Yeah, so I think these are all kind of in the same, um, how do we do this question, right? Like, how do we get along with people when we know our country and our country is so divided and that, go, that comes right down to our families and our friends. Like, everyone is divided on, on this um, political upheaval that we've had. Um, so I think the first thing that I would say is, and I just said this to my high school guidance counselor at the wedding reception. She came up to me. She's like, I need spiritual guidance. I don't want to go to Thanksgiving dinner. And I said to her, Mary, don't go. Okay, you don't have to go to Thanksgiving dinner this year, friends. I'm just going to put that out there. I know it's shocking. You can do something different this year. It's okay. You have to take care of yourself. You have to protect your mental health. She was like, I know. I'm a guidance counselor. I know about mental health. Um, <laughs> It's okay to say, this isn't a good space for me right now. I'm not going to be able to engage these conversations in a way that are healthy and productive and uplifting and loving. And so I'm going to remove myself from that situation this year. Maybe we'll be able to do it next year, but this year I'm going to do something different. That's a perfectly valid choice. So I just want to affirm, if that's your decision this year, you don't have to put yourself in that situation simply for tradition's sake or simply because you know your blood relatives. You know, Jesus actually has this really fascinating um, statement that he makes in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 49, where he says, I did not come to bring peace to this world. I came to divide this world. I came to divide families such that a family of five will be three against two and two against three. I can't think of a more relevant verse than that right now. Like, our beliefs and our deep-held convictions are going to divide us at this point from people who don't uh, feel the same way. And that's okay. I think we can still enter into those conversations when we're ready from a place of respect and love. But if we're not ready yet, that's not a good situation. If it's not a good time for you to enter into those conversations, I think you have to make that decision for yourself. And um, thanks. Here we go. And just wait until it is a good time for you. Now, when it is a good time and you're ready, um, I think there's a way to do this that is uh, productive, and I think that starts with asking a lot of questions from the person who feels differently about the world than you. I think it starts with saying, so tell me why you voted for that, or tell me why you voted for that person, because I don't understand. And then they'll tell you, and then you'll say, why, does that, why is that issue so important to you? I'm, I'm so curious why you feel strongly about that. And then they'll share. And then eventually you can get to a place, hopefully, where you can say, would you mind if I shared my opinion and why I voted for this other candidate and why that's really important to me? And at least you can have that conversation, but I think it starts with asking questions. Um, but again, I wouldn't try to have that conversation if emotions are high, feelings are heavy. I just don't think it's productive. Yeah, I, kind of two responses to this. One ties into the devotion we just put out this last week. 
kind of stating that emotions don't have a timeline. We don't have to rush through what we're feeling and think that as people of faith, we have to get to a certain emotional response by a certain time. That it's okay to sit in grief or anger and feel what we're feeling however long that it takes. It doesn't mean that we've got to be the one to get right back up the next day and keep moving and keep acting and, and, and keep loving. It's okay to be able to sit in our grief and our feelings, which is why scripture has so many passages of people feeling all of the breadth of emotions from grief to anger. And it presents that in a way to say like, it's okay to sit in these different emotions and to be in those emotions. And something else that I believe really strongly is that a benefit of community is the fact that we feel collectively, which means that when we don't have hope, sometimes we need to be in a community where someone else can have the hope for us. Or if we're feeling angry, we can have someone in our community who is feeling the opposite of that and can kind of hold the feelings of peace and reconciliation for us if we're not there yet. So by being in community together in a space like church, we're able to collectively have the feelings we need, even if individually we're in a different place than someone else. And so I think that's a really beautiful part of church. And you and I earlier this week were talking about that idea of love your enemy, which is a central teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, and it is a hard teaching, and it is one that we have to continue to focus on and preach. Um, but sometimes there's confusion about what exactly it means to love your enemy. Um, loving your enemy doesn't mean that you don't get to have an opinion. It doesn't mean that you don't stand up for what you believe in. Loving your enemy doesn't mean that you become a doormat and someone's opinions get to run over you. Um, when we were talking about it earlier this week, you even said, like, loving your enemy doesn't mean you become friends with your enemy even. Um, loving your enemy is just a recognition that the divine is in every single person, that no human is beyond redemption, and the second that we fail to see the divinity in another person is the moment in which we perpetuate the hate that we are experiencing toward us, perhaps, or towards a marginalized community. And so to be able to say love your enemies is to say, uh, just like Dr. King, we cannot become the hate that we experience. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Or um, right after the election, I read a passage in our kind of Wednesday sharing time from James Baldwin, his book, The Fire Next Time, when he's telling his nephew, like, look, the reality is, is that you can't force these other people to love you. But the really hard thing is, is that you sometimes have to love them. To be able to understand that someone else is divine, um, is the hard part, but it is necessary because otherwise we're perpetuating the same evil and the same hatred because that's where it starts, is people viewing someone as not human, dehumanizing them, marginalizing them. However, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to roll over and not have an opinion. Right. Um, that also reminds me of this great teaching that Jesus has where he says, love your enemies, um, but do not repay evil for evil. And so he then goes into his dialogue about um, if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. And if someone asks, if someone takes your coat, offer them your other coat as well, or your shirt as well. And um, when you drill down into these teachings, they're nonviolent resistance. So when he's saying if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek, in his culture, if someone slaps you, they're going to use their right hand. And if you turn the other cheek and invite them to slap you on the other cheek, they have to use their left hand, which was a shameful act in their culture. So he's inviting you to pull out some shame from them. Because the first slap might feel good, but the second slap with your left hand actually feels really shameful and embarrassing, right? And if someone steals your coat, he's saying, give them your shirt too. Well, then you're shirtless and naked. In his culture, that would be extremely embarrassing and awkward. So now you're, again, pulling out the shame of this interaction from your enemy. You're, it's sort of this nonviolent resistance showing like, what a shameful thing you've done to me by stealing my coat. Do you want my shirt too? So you're, you're pulling out something in them that's supposed to, the shame is supposed to then remind them of their humanity and sort of shock them into thinking like, wow, I just slapped this person. That was terrible. 
and they're inviting me to do it again, and I'm not going to because I'm still a human being. And so Jesus is teaching us how to encounter these um, ugly, uncomfortable situations by using ourselves to not repay evil with more evil, but to turn, like flip the script and offer something different. All right, All right so let's go to the next, next question. question. Okay. Um, Jen, there are three questions here about reproductive justice. Okay. So two people asking the same question of how can the church better support reproductive justice, but someone else kind of um, asking another way to frame that, which is how, as people of faith, can, um, why would people of faith support unlimited abortion? That was a question. Okay, that's a great question. So, so the first part of this, I think, is understanding that um, the term abortion is so loaded, and I, I don't know at what point in our culture that term became less about healthcare and became about this like imaginary scenario where couples are going out and like wantonly getting pregnant and then deciding they don't want the baby and having abortions. Like, um, abortion is healthcare in the sense that anyone who has had a DNC procedure after a miscarriage where they remove the um, non-viable pregnancy and they remove the tissue, that is an abortion. I have had one and it was devastating. Anyone who knows me knows how badly I have wanted to have children and how, how difficult it is trying to get pregnant again. And my medical records show that I had an abortion because I had a miscarriage and I had to have a DNC because I couldn't pass that non-viable fetus naturally. So it's a very emotional topic. And if, if people don't understand that and they think this other scenario in which you're just going out and getting pregnant and then deciding you don't want this pregnancy and you know deciding you're going to have an abortion, that's just, that's not the most common um, reason of why abortions are, are happening. They're, it's a medical necessity for many women. Um, and so it's a very, um, it's a personal topic. And I think as people of faith, the first thing we need to do is talk about that and educate ourselves about that and, and educate our friends and family about that and say, you know, um, the term abortion is a medical term. It's used for pregnancies that are not viable. And many women need that in order to survive. It's a devastating procedure for many women. Um, and we should not uh, ban that from them. That's a, a human right. A lot of women need that in order to um, move on with their lives and, and move on from a pregnancy that's not viable. It's very difficult. Yeah. So that's the first um, part, I think, is educating ourselves and talking about that. Um, in terms of reproduct reproductive rights, I think, again, it's a, ter it's, a, it's a lot of education that needs to happen. So one of the issues um, with this new administration and the Project 2025 document, which I'm sure many of you have, have read or at least looked at, um, is this idea that um, we should not be supporting IVF and fertility treatments because it creates embryos and embryos should have rights because they're already a, a person. Um, again, this is a very emotional topic for me personally going through IVF. Um, what happens in the process of IVF is that in the lab they create embryos with um, the female's eggs and the husband's or the partner's sperm. And those embryo, if they fertilize, they do become an embryo, and then they're often genetically tested to see if they're viable. Um, if they're not viable because they're having, you know, a different uh, genetic abnormality, they will discard the embryos. And this is where a lot of quote-unquote pro-life people are against this, for, this fertility treatment because they're discarding non-viable embryos. Um, so again, I think we have to educate ourselves and educate one another and explain in order to find an embryo that is viable, you will have to create multiple embryos and some of them will not be viable. And this is part of, this is a medical procedure. This is part of what couples are trying to do who are trying desperately to have children. Yeah, and IVF is a way that so many families of different makeups create their families. Right. Um, and that was so beautifully said, thanks Jen. And, and on the um, you know, other side of the spectrum is just this idea of you know, reproductive justice is something that you and I both believe in and the idea that women should have autonomy over their own bodies, that legislative bodies should not be making decisions on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, and so that question of like, how can a, a Christian support unlimited abortion? That's not necessarily what the conversation's about. The conversation is about how can we support women making choices over their own body? And for all of the folks who consider themselves pro-life, how can we as people of faith actually live that out? And that looks like 
uh, supporting a birth after it happens. It looks like healthcare. It looks like early childhood education. It looks like access to food. Um, there are so many ways in which people in our country are not supported in living and flourishing and face themselves uh, are facing just horrible circumstances in poverty and yet no one is coming to their aid who's necessarily pro-life to say like we've got to protect these people right. um, and help them to flourish so um, even for pregnancies where there's a non-viable embryo i think you and i would support reproductive justice not to say like this is um, you know unlimited and there's no it's just a sense of we want to promote life where life um, is able to flourish and for someone making a very personal choice about their body scientifically um, we want to support them in making those decisions so right. that's where you and i stand that can't be the 15 minute timer that already, was the 15 it? minute warning but oh we'll go a little longer God. we have to, yeah, we got to get to a few more questions yeah so i think to summarize what we're saying um educating ourselves on this topic is the first part because just talking sort of like um hypothetically about abortions is not helpful in this conversation i think educating ourselves about what that actually means and why that's important to, to couples and to women, and then um, supporting women's choice in that, understanding that it's such a personal thing, it's such a difficult decision for many couples, um, and that's why, as people of faith, we want to support people going through difficult decisions and difficult times. All right, let's try, let's try for, for a couple more. Um, do you see a good one here? Um, well, I want to address one comment. Um, I don't know if it was made by a member of the community or someone um, outside the community tuning in today, um, but the question was, um, why do you push trans issues so much? I'm an ally, but it feels like you're um, pushing it in my eyes. Um, and so just kind of want to address that and say, you know, first of all, this is Transgender Awareness Week, a week for us to talk about trans issues and a reason to have so many events um, about the trans community today. I think another reason is that $300 million was spent over the last couple of months to attack our trans siblings. And so they are very much worried for their own livelihood. Um, and we get comments and emails all the time like um, of, you know, wish we would talk more about this issue or that issue. And I wish we could talk about every issue every single week. Um, the reality is, is that we have to continue to talk about issues that are going to impact the world and that are very present. You know, I really wish I could talk about Palestine every week. I wish I could talk about trans issues every week. I wish I could talk about climate justice every week. Um, and we will address those as much as we can in addition to just talking about our own individual spiritual journeys of how can we forgive people? How can we um, get through our lives as people of faith? And so we'll try to talk about all of that, but yeah. that is an issue to talk about a lot only because um, who else is talking about it? Who else is standing up for our trans siblings if not the church? Amen. The church needs to, and it's got to be the church. Amen. I also will say we have trans members of this congregation, we have trans kids in our youth program, and we will always stand up for trans rights and talk about it because, um, again, educating ourselves, talking about it is the only way that these um, rights are, are held sacred because we, we, not, we acknowledge um, the importance of trans people among us and trans um, suicide rates are high trans death rates are high. If you come to our trans service of remembrance on Wednesday, you'll hear more about that in, in great detail. And, and we as people of faith, we want to support all of that. Um, we want to support trans people in every step of life. So we'll always talk about that. Okay. Do you have a last one or I'll um, share a last one? Yeah, you can share a last one. Okay. Um, let's do, how does God help people going through heartbreak? Oh, I was going to, okay, sure. Yep. There's a lot. There's a lot here. We There's can't get through all. There's a lot here. Um, Which one were you going to do? Well, someone asked a more... Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> There's some personal questions for you and I on here, but we could address that in a, maybe in a, a, a digital devotion. Sounds okay. good. Okay. All right. Do you have a response? How does God help us get through heartbreak? How does God help us get through heartbreak? Um... So I'm a big believer in that God most clearly manifests God's self through community. So when I'm hurting, I can always count on the community to come around me in, in different ways. It's in, it's in a hug, it's in a note, it's in an email, it's in um, someone saying something kind. It's, 
It's all the little ways that your people show up for you. To me, that is God's hands and feet in my life, and that is always something to be counted on in times of heartbreak. Yeah. Um, I, I really wish faith in God did away with all the hardships of life and that it was easy living after belief in God. Um, but that's just not the reality, and that's not the promise of Christ either. Um, the promise is not that hardships will go away, but that God walks with us in those moments of hardship. And I, I know it can be really hard to feel like that's true or that we feel God's presence. I think you're spot on that community is the place where we can actually feel God. Community is also very human, and so even Claremont UCC, like, community can fail sometimes, and even in the midst of community, we can feel alone. And so I just share with everyone here, everyone watching online, if there's ever a moment where you feel alone or that the community hasn't gathered around you, I really want you to feel safe enough to reach out to us and say, like, I'm lonely, I'm feeling alone in this, I don't think I can keep going, I need some help, and we would love to be able to respond to that. Um, and so we hope that this can be a safe place to, to help get through heartbreak. Um, but it, it takes time in all of its forms to just keep walking somehow and keep trusting in that promise because the world does give us so much to disbelieve the promise, to say, like, God's not there for me anymore. Um, as pastors, we feel that all the time. Like, how, how can I get up in front of the church and preach about God when in this moment, like, I'm doubting the whole thing myself um, and I'm not feeling God's presence right now? Um, and to be able to just, like, keep putting one step or just one moment after the other and to say that um, I, I can trust the promise even when I, I don't trust the promise right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the whole basis of faith. All right, okay. folks, these are great questions, are great and there's questions. a lot that there's we so didn't get more. to. So we're going to have to just have some of our digital devotions coming yeah. up to address these questions. We'll do it again next week. Again, if you didn't get one on there, feel free to write it out to us. Um, and let's um, kick it over to the choir. All right.